Good to have you. Welcome to Life Point Church. I am Pastor Jeff. How you doing? All right. Doing all right. Doing good. We're working on a series here, Believe the Way of Freedom. And we're just going to jump into it again today. And I, and I need you to go to Hebrews chapter 11 again, if you will. Go to Hebrews chapter 11. And if you haven't marked these verses yet, do so. Uh, begin to think about it throughout the week. And we're discovering why believe matters, why believing God matters, why faith matters, why it's important. I mean, you just see it throughout the scriptures. I mean, Jesus talked about it a lot. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believes will receive. And um, so we're, we're starting with a definition here. It's the great chapter, Heroes of Faith. And it starts out now, faith, verse 1 is being sure of what we hope for, being convinced of what we do not see. Notice this kind of faith has to do with not seeing but believing still. For by it, the people of old received God's commendation. And then skip down to verse 6, and it tells us why this kind of faith received God's commendation, his approval, his regard. For, or now, for without faith, heart kind of faith, it is impossible to please him for the one who approaches God must believe that he exists, that he is. How many of you already believe God is? All right. Now notice the next part. And that he rewards those who seek him. That's another way of saying that God is good. How many believe God is good? So, right? So you've, you've already, you're already, uh, you've got a head start here. So. We've looked at, we're working on top 10 things to know about faith according to the scriptures. We've given you eight of them so far, so we've got two to go, and I'm going to give you another today, but I want to start again with number eight, was seven, eight, but the spirit of faith is the spirit of victory. And here we see this, and this is such good news, the spirit of faith is the spirit of victory. First John 5, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. So it, who is it that overcomes the world? That's you, the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Again, are you one that believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So you have this on the inside of you. This is the spirit of faith, the spirit of victory. It has to do with overcoming. So what we're looking at is how to know the difference between faith and then doubt, the spirit of doubt and unbelief. So we're learning how, what to yield to in this life, the faith part, and what to resist in this other part. And this other part, this, this spirit of doubt and unbelief, learning what it is, it really helps. I mean, it's been helping me just to catch myself saying, no, 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 I'm not yielding to that. Uh, I'm yielding to the faith that's on the inside of me. And so we've looked at uh, the, the kind of faith that it is, but if the spirit of faith is the spirit of victory, then what is at the heart of the spirit of doubt and unbelief? That would be the spirit of defeat. There's a pessimism to it. It's uh, we're not going to overcome. We're not going to make it. And don't tell me it's going to be a good day. How many have ever woken up and, and somebody says, hey, isn't it going to be a great day? And you said, yeah. <laughs> Come on. Anybody ever awakened grumpy before? Nobody? Thank you, sir, for the truth that comes forth there. I'm saying grumpy because I looked, I Googled characters known for their pessimism, all right? And to my surprise, grumpy and grouchy characters came up. So this was an article called 10 of the Grumpiest and Grouchiest Characters of All Time. Ten of, and I'm not going to get into all these, the grumpiest characters of all time. Uh, how many know that's Stanley Hudson right there, right? Of the office show, uh, there was they had Carl Fredrickson of the film Up was another, but he actually good news came out of his grumpiness. But before that, Carl Fredrickson said to Little Russell, "Hey, let's play a game. It's called See Who Can Be Quiet the Longest." Right? Cool. My mom loves that game. Uh, and then there's uh, the grumpy neighbor. This is where a lot of these shows come from. How many remember Mr. Wilson? George Wilson of Dennis the Menace. You know, Dennis was just a kid trying to have fun, and Mr. Wilson, no, no fun around here. And then my favorite, uh, pessimist grouch character of all time, who made the list, is of course the one and only Squidward Tentacles of SpongeBob. 
square pants, same. Here's a quote from Squidward uh, to SpongeBob. I order the food, you cook the food, then the customer gets the food. We do that for 40 years and then we die. What great example. There's the spirit of doubt and unbelief right between the two optimists right there. You can see it on the face. Here's what we're looking at. You know, well, I'm, how do we know, and it sounds so general, but I'm learning that there's so much going on behind these two forces, the spirit of faith and believing, the spirit of doubt and unbelief. We don't label it that. And so we don't know what we're, we're being challenged by. So here, we're giving you four. Characteristics of doubt, stubbornness, sarcasm, complaining, and criticizing. We looked at stubborn side of doubt last time we were together. Let's look at this sarcasm business. And this can be challenging. Um, this is a control for the tongue, for the mouth. And we're going to look at how to do that. It's probably, the scriptures actually say it's one of the most challenging things we'll face in life is gaining control over our mouth gaining control over our words. And I don't think we realize just how powerful our words are, whether positive or negative. Uh, it's almost, the scriptures talk about how words are like arrows. How many know if, you, if you've shot an arrow, I mean, it's not like you can run and grab it. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, you've, you've let it go. Uh, of course, you can apologize later for shooting somebody with an arrow, right? For that, with the words. But the words can... And, and, but it's, man, this has helped me because I, 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 I can struggle in this area of sarcasm. Anybody else with that? You know what I mean? And we've got to watch it because I'm going to show you that it can eventually mess things up because we're, release, we're releasing things into the atmosphere. And I know there's, there's an innocent sarcasm. It, it's not a deal like hyperbole. Jesus used hyperbole. But there, this is a different kind here. This is where bitterness begins to show up. Or you're very frustrated, and you've got to watch it when you're frustrated that it does not get a hold of your mouth because that's where some damage can happen. Not just to others, but to, but to our own lives. So here's just a simple definition of sarcasm. The use of irony, right from Oxford, the use of irony to mock or convey contempt, to scoff, to scorn, to ridicule, to sneer. So what is behind this? Because that's just an effect of this spirit that we're talking about of doubt and unbelief. So I'm going to give you three examples here of what this looks like, this sarcasm. And uh, three scriptural examples, three characters. And the first one is again with Doubting Thomas. It's interesting, and we know that eventually he came out of this pessimism, but he starts out troubled and challenged by this. And it, it's good news if the disciples were challenged and they, they were able to come out eventually of some things. How many know it's good news for us that the Lord can help us and, and change us? But every time Thomas is mentioned in the Gospels, there's a negative element to it. And you've got to know the Greek and the context. We know he said, you know, unless I see, I will not believe. And then Jesus said, listen, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Here's another account of Thomas. Jesus says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. And then he says to them, the disciples, and you know the way to the place where I am going. And then doubting Thomas speaks up and goes, well, uh, no, actually, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Did you hear that? There's a little bit of an attitude in that. How many thinks if Jesus says you know the way, you know the way? Tom, well, actually, we don't. I know nobody here would be like that. Can you hear a little bit of sarcasm in there? Actually, we don't know the way. And Jesus said, listen, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's where that came from. And he was strong about that. So that's another thing. Here, here's doubting sarcasm all the way, Mr. Thomas. And there's been some that thought this was honorable, but they've not really looked at it, the context and how it reads in the Greek. So here's the backstory again. Lazarus has died, right? The family, the Lord was friends with them. Jesus was out of town. Jesus hears about it, waits another couple of days. Then he says to his disciples, it's time to return to Bethany in Judea, 
which is close to Jerusalem, which was dangerous at that time for Jesus to be there. So he was out of town. And uh, the religious leaders there, they were wanting to take him out. And the disciples knew about it. They knew about it. So Jesus waits a few days, and then he says to his disciples, he says to them, we're going to go back. So then Jesus told them plainly, his disciples, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. So let us go to him. The context, the Greek is Jesus says, let us go to him. And then he turns and he begins to walk away. All right, here's what happens. When he be turns and begins to walk away, here comes Thomas. Bringing up John, uh, John 11, 16. Then Thomas, who was called Didymus, the twin, said to his fellow disciples, notice he doesn't say to Jesus' face. He waits till he's walked away. And here comes the sarcasm. This is not positive. He, he looks at his disciples, and I believe he just rolled his eyes, and he goes, let's go too, so we can die with him. Why are you getting quiet on me? If, if the disciples were challenged by this stuff, are we going to be challenged by it? There, this was not positive. He was, now notice this. Thomas, this is how the spirit of doubt and unbelief is. It plants seeds of doubt in those who are around it. Did you notice it's sneaky? He, he waits for it to, you know, and then he looks at his, the disciples, Thomas does, and goes, blah, 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 blah. How many have ever had somebody come up to you and kind of in a whispery kind of way go, blah, 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 about something, about somebody? Are you with me now? Oh, well, they're really la 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 la. In the foyer, after the service, somebody sneaks up to you and goes, Well, that was a really good service. <laughs> Pastor Jeff really preached it today. Yeah, but I'm not struggling with doubt. Are we sure? Are we, were, were we getting into this right here? So here, here's a good word. Watch out for snarky, sarcastic people. <laughs> and let's not be one of them. <laughs> oh, my. It's getting quiet, Lord. Help me. Help me. Because <laughs> this stuff is real. This stuff is real. And we, we don't have to yield to it. I know we have, and we'll talk about it. So where did all this get started? The spirit of doubt and unbelief. It goes all the way back to the beginning with the devil himself, the father of lies. He's also the father of the spirit of doubt and unbelief. He's been in rebellion against God from ancient of days. We don't know the whole story, but we know there was a time there where he started to doubt God. He started to not believe him. He believed in him. He started not to believe him. He didn't like the boundaries talks about he and their angels, they left the boundaries that were set up, and he, he began to, to not like God, and so the Spirit, it really comes from him. And I heard a minister say one time, and it, and it helps you to know what's happening, so the, the enemy will always reveal himself because he can't stop the mocking. He can't stop with the disrespect and the dishonor. It just, sooner or later, it just comes out, and you go, oh, okay, I see that. Here it is with Eve. Remember in Genesis 3, Adam was right there as well. And then uh, we won't get into that. Here, here we go. The serpent. We got Genesis 3 and 1. Now the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord of God had made. Um, and one day, we believe this is Satan one way or another. And one day, now notice, I'm going to add the word sarcastically. And one day he asked the woman sarcastically, did God really say, really? How many heard that before? Did God really, 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 that you can't eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? And the thought is, because that would be like him. That would sure be like him, because everybody, everybody knows he's a Scrooge. Did he say you can't eat from any of these awesome trees? I mean, that's like him. He's so strict and restrictive. The no fun God. Has anybody ever heard that before? 
There are so many today who, 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 are, who have fallen for this very lie. That God is the God who's holding back the fun. No, he's holding back the sin which destroys the life because he loves the person. He's not holding back. Listen, you can have all kinds of fun in the Lord. You know, in, in, in the Old Testament, he had his people. He would have them come together and have feasts, also known as parties. No amen on that? I thought you'd say amen. He would have them come together and have parties and fellowship. Now, they were a little conservative. But they would jam and praise the Lord, and they would dance, and they would shout. And he said, he commanded them to praise him. And if you don't think we're going to have fun in heaven, you don't, you don't have a clue. It's going to be the greatest thing ever. Man, I'm going to get up, up in heaven. I'm just going to run like nobody's business. Like I wanted to do as a kid. Remember as a kid, you wanted to run super fast like Flash? And I'm going to run by you. And you're going to say, who was that? Like, oh, that's Pastor Jeff. He's been running for years up here, just running. We can't stop him. This is this. Really? Did he say? And he is sneaking in his mockery of God. And he was able, he, it threw Eve off. No, no, that's not right. And it threw her off. And then he, he, he comes against him. But I'm I just, we're not going to get into all this. But he's accusing God of being something he's not. It's a lie. This is where this comes from. And here's another, one more example. Because we are told to look at Israel in the wilderness to learn what not to do and what to do. Another example of this, this spirit of sarcasm. Um, so here they are after the parting of the Red Sea. And this is an example of how to be and not to be. So they've been saved. <laughs> And they've come out, and it's a miracle. The sea has parted, and they're on the other side, and the Egyptians have drowned. Absolutely a miracle. And it says they get on the other side, and you talk about a party. You talk about just rejoicing. And they have this whole chapter of a list of a song that they sang. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider he has thrown into the sea. How many remember the song we used to sing in the 80s was this? Five of us. Well, if you didn't hear it, let me sing it for you, okay, this morning. Yes. I will sing unto the Lord, for he is triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. Da, da, da. I will sing unto the Lord, for he is triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. That's it. Glory to God. Yeah. <laughs> However, one month later, The thrill is gone. <laughs> and now it appears th th things are dry. Lord, where you at? Things are dry. And uh, they begin to suffer and to, 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 to struggle to hold on to their confidence. And so it starts, they, they started in it, they didn't have to continue in it, but, can it, but why I'm sharing this with you is because this kind of stuff can eventually mess up your life when it comes to the promised land. Because this, this is how it started to come out. And so here comes the, 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 the snarcasm. Uh, did I say snarcasm? Yeah. Hey, that's a good word for it right there. I just made up a word. Snark and snarcasm together. And here comes their really? Exodus 16 and 3. Uh, that's what helped me to... To put it how it would sound, it was kind of like this. If only the Lord had killed us back in Egypt. You see what I mean? How do we know when this stuff is coming? How do we? Right here. It got hold of their mouth. Now notice they moaned. They just a month ago saw the Red Sea parted. They were charismatic, jumping, praising. What, what's going on? Then they say, then they start looking back. How many know, don't look back. And they were, they were slaves, and they're, they're starting to, to, not, to add stuff. There we sat around pot filled with meat, 
and ate all the bread we wanted. Sounds like Olive Garden. (laughs) Yeah, we had Olive Garden back then. Remember how (laughs) Olive Garden moved? The art Olive Garden moved. But now you have brought us into this wilderness to starve us all to death. Not true. And uh, eventually that got him into trouble. Didn't have to. They could have come out of it. Got him into trouble. How can we know the spirit of doubt and unbelief is tempting us? It's coming against us. It's here. And so there is a challenge here. There is a discipline. But just being aware of it is half the battle. Just being aware of it. Like I told you, just looking at this and studying this, it's helping me. Just personally, just like, no, no. (laughs) And as you can see, it's a full-time job to control one's own personal mouth. How many think that's true? We we don't have no business trying to correct somebody else, say, well, shame on you. You No, just just, just us. Right here, it is a full-time job. I'm going to take hold of my mouth, and I'm going to keep my mouth positive. I'm going to keep my mouth this way. I'm not going to be sarcastic here. I'm going to bite my tongue. No, we're not going to do that. James 3 and verse 2. For we all stumble in many ways. That's true, but notice. But if someone does not stumble in what he or she says, he or she is a mature man, a mature Christian. Notice we're coming into maturity when, when we start to, with, with the help of the Holy Spirit now, but we've made a decision. We're, we're going to control our words. We're going to control our mouth. It belongs to the Lord. So here's number nine in our list. Got one more to go, but here's number nine. What to know about faith according to the scriptures, and that is how faith is released in word and action. Faith is released in a good word and action. Faith is released in a good report and action. Will you all say that with me? Faith faith is released in word and action. Faith is released in word and action. A good word. Notice that. And we've got the verses for it, Romans 10 and 9. And these go together. Notice the faith is being released. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, because you've believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And speaking is an action. And there's other actions, like the one with issue of blood. She said, if I can just touch his garment. And she acted corresponding action. That's the next one in James 2 and 26. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works corresponding action is dead. So how do we release our faith in a good word, in a good report, and with our actions? Uh, We know Joshua and Caleb. There was 12 spies went into the land. The 10 pessimists didn't make it. The the two that, that stayed with God and believed, Joshua and Caleb, they did get their land. How many agree with me we're going to be Joshua and Caleb's? Joshua and Caleb's. We can, you might say, well, I don't know what the percent of is that, but hey, we can do it. We can do it. How many have heard a commercial that says one in five dentists or or whatever? How many know we can be the one? Right? There might be over here, but hey, we can be the one. There. But here was Joshua and Caleb. God will surely bring us into the land and give it to us. So do not fear the people of the land, for they are like bread to us. We would say a piece of cake with God on our side. Piece of cake. For their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. You've got two different reports. The one they called a bad report, an evil report, actually, in the King James Version. And here we have the spirit of faith is the spirit of victory. No, the Lord is with us. We got this. You have this on the inside. Where do we start here with this discipline of controlling the tongue? Yes. And it starts with our own personal commitment. And I know this is challenging, so I want to say here, because you can, get, you can start thinking, well, man, I've missed it in this area, this doubt. Because when you begin to see it, you start saying, whoa, whoa, I have missed it here, and I've fallen. We've talked about this last week, and I want to conclude last week. I got caught up in the message last week, and I had a certain ending, but I didn't get to it. But here we are again today. I thought you'd be more excited about this great ending that I have prepared for you. Listen, if you've fallen, we all have. How many have missed it in the house today before? And you're, uh, five people. We need to show everybody. How many here, you've missed it in some way in this area? The doubt and the things coming again. How many have ever missed it in saying the wrong thing before? Boy, the hands went up a lot quicker on that one. 
I should have just said that. Right? And, and it's not uh, try, try again. <laughs> but we can get back up and go for it. We confess it. God forgives. And I believe he, he's a dad who, who picks you right back up and say, come on, come on. It's, it's like, good try. You're, you're doing it. You're doing it. And I use the illustration of riding a bike. How many remember the times you were riding the bike? Just learning how to ride the bike. And you know, you've got, you got your dad right there, your father right there, helping you along the way. Unless your dad just pushed you and said, good luck. Some dads are like that. Have you seen the, the, the ones where they throw the kids into the pool? They're like, yeah, it makes them strong. <laughs> are you sure? It looks like they're drowning to me. Yeah, but look how they're learning. <laughs> so I remembered, man, as a kid, crash in. Crash in. I mean, evil Knievel days, trying to be like him, 70s baby, crashing, and yet getting up and getting back on that bike, even with the blood and the scratches and, and the whole thing. And I told you, I remember I, there was a, a there's an eight millimeter film of me jumping a ramp with kids under it somewhere out there. So here was the picture I had, and this is not me. But that, I think that is awesome. If I've ever seen a more awesome picture, right there it is. How many know that's the spirit of victory right there? I've got this. I've got this. But I like if you can't read what it says there, notice in the background there's the dad just sitting there. And it says, just want to send a shout out to the adult sitting on the porch who watched this entire scenario unfold and he just sat there, amen. I think it's cool, he, he even has an audience. <laughs> he has the girls as the audience. Oh, my hero! <laughs> I don't know what happened there. I wish there was another picture to see about that kid on the end. Glory to God. We've all had our disappointments. In our next series, we're going to be talking about overcoming that in the spirit of faith, coming out of disappointment. Sometimes it's one of the hardest challenges of life. The disappointments. Man, that did not, I thought it would not. Uh. We've all had our failures. But the spirit of faith is the spirit of, I'm not giving up. You've got that spirit on the inside of you. And man, it just keeps coming out of me. I know it's the Lord helping me to encourage you because there's some in here who are really struggling with this. Listen, you're loved. Your life has meaning and purpose. Do not give up. Do not. Do not. Psalm 145 and 14, the Lord upholds, lifts up all that fall and raises up all those that are oppressed. That is his heart. So in closing, I was at the library. Sometimes I like to go there many times just got a spirit to it and the way it, also the library has its own culture don't get me started with that it's like its own soap opera if you go there enough it's got its own characters in there I, I wish I could do a show just on what it, it would be boring but <laughs> us nerds at the library you know with it but I came across a video clip of the runner in, in track and field her name is Heather Dornadin and if you bring up the first picture and she got known as someone who fell in a race. This is an important race. I forget it was a championship going on. This was college. This, this was a 600-meter race. This is 2008. And she fell. I mean, she fell, just wham. And actually, her head gets hit by the other runner. It gets hit. And, but she, she, she gets up. And she just starts taking off. And she's way behind now. And I'm in the library now, guys. And, um, and I, you got to try to be quiet. But I started getting excited about this. Started, yeah, go, go. And I had to keep it on the inside. Go. And I started to go, 
go. And she caught up to the one runner, got to the other. And then towards the end, she passed. She had fallen. She had passed all the runners. And here she comes across the finish line. She didn't give up. She had fallen. And I almost stood up in the library and went, yeah. And everybody would have thought I was weird because I had it in the headphones. Wouldn't know what's going on. Heather Dornadin was the one. And then there was just people have made up hundreds now that just out there. I don't say it's a meme, but they've made up hundreds of positive sayings with her. And here was one, the girl who didn't give up, but instead got up and won. And I thought, you know, that should be every Christian believer. <laughs> the Christian who didn't give up, but instead got up and won. <laughs> Glory to God. That's you. So actually, get up this morning. Jump up on your feet. Strong up on your feet. Glory to God. Father, we thank you. Glory to God. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you for your encouragement today. Your encouragement that we begin to, to watch our the words, watch our mouth, and know what to say. And let me encourage you again in this. It's like a race. And the word for race there in Hebrews 12, it says how we're running a race. It actually is the word marathon. It's not a sprint. How many are glad this life isn't a sprint? It feels like it's a sprint, don't it? Man, it feels like, where did 50 years go? Wow, a sprint. But it's actually, it's a marathon. And so there's a, you, you're supposed to, to run with patience and you have, a, you have a good pace going. And it talks about laying aside the weights and, and the sin that's tripped you up. And it's talking about, the Lord knew what was gonna happen, we fall, but his forgiveness, we get back up and we go. And I've memorized Hebrews 12, one and two. This goes back many, many years ago. And I didn't realize how much it would mean to me later on in years to know. And sometimes I, I feel like I can sense it. But it talks about how we are surrounded with a great crowd of heavenly witnesses who are cheering us on. And when you're younger, you, you think you're going to live forever. <laughs> yeah, but over the years, there's, there's folks, family and friends who've, who've gone on. And sometimes I just, I just imagine that they're, somehow they can witness what's happened. And I feel like they're going, don't get up. Come on, you got this. Come on, get up. You got this. So Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, King James Version. <laughs> I've got it marked in my study Bible, King James Study Bible. But it helps if you can memorize it in King James, it works because of the us in it. Wherefore seeing, we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight in the sin which doth beset us. And let us run with patience. The race set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Us, us, us. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of his majesty on high. Did you hear that he is the author and the finisher of our faith? That means he, he's going to finish it. And he's going to do a good and faithful work. Amen. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your word. We thank you. You've got the spirit of encouragement, Lord, in your people. That whatever they might have gone through, whether it's from years ago, it can be laid aside. You do forgive and you do forget. And we thank you for lifting us up. And we thank you. We've got a brand new start tomorrow. And we will go forth and we will have a good report that you will lift us up and see us through. In Jesus' name, amen.